morning everyone uh, our event is uh, um, we, we are expecting some more people as the gate of the university opens so please uh, bear with us uh, this little delay uh, but in the meanwhile maybe i can ask uh, i can request uh, you all to come a little forward and be closer to the speaker the, the seats are not reserved you are <laughs> welcome to occupy them and have a great view of the screen and interact closer with the speaker <coughs>
Good evening. Uh, welcome to Ayuka. I'm Shamukh Rai and I'm so glad to see that um, so many people have come this evening. Uh, last week we had uh, a science festival which had four evening talks. So I thought uh, people might be saturated with astronomy and uh, give this week a miss. But I'm so glad to see that we still have enthusiasm um, <laughs> for uh, public talk at Ayuka. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, we are so uh, fortunate today to have with us uh, uh, Professor Saku Suneta, um, who is the Director General of the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan, which uh, is the uh, major institution which looks after all the optical facilities, the major optical facilities, and now, of course, uh, some of the other telescopes in, um, in Japan. So, for example, this is uh, as Director General of the NAOJ. He's responsible for the Subaru Telescope in Hawaii, um, Jap Japan's contribution to the ALMA Telescope in Chile, and also um, the upcoming 30-meter telescope, TMT, in which India is also a partner uh, with Japan in building uh, the 30-meter telescope, which will probably be in Hawaii. Uh, Suneta-san uh, uh, has had a career in space sciences uh, in building X-ray telescopes to study the sun. He's been a solar astronomer um, all his life. Um, he was, for example, uh, uh, one of the major people building um, X-ray telescopes um, to study the sun as uh, early as uh, the Japanese satellite, uh, uh, the Japanese facility called Hinotori, and then Yoko. Uh, these are, um, the Yoko was of course done uh, in uh, collaboration with NASA um, to study the sun. And uh, he has also been a, a professor at the University of Tokyo, but has spent a large fraction of his life at the National Astronomical Observatory, um, and now which is called the NAOJ. Um, I will hand the podium to him, and he's going to take us um, uh, through a history of the sun and um, life on planets. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm an astronomer studying the sun uh, with the instrument uh, that I have developed uh, with my fellow scientists and engineers all over the world. So far, I have been involved in the uh, development of uh, three scientific satellites, two small uh, sounding rocket experiment, and uh, two balloon flights. So I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, observing the enigmatic sun over the past 30 years. And uh, we have made a few major discoveries that are helping to unlock the sun's mysteries. Therefore, my talk today is about the sun and the life on planets. Uh, before proceeding to the topic, uh, let me mention the big questions uh, facing astronomers now. Those are how did life first appear on Earth? Are there Earth-like rocky planets in the habitable zones, which is the region uh, the light distance from the parent star for liquid water to be stable uh, of other stars. Does extraterrestrial life exist? Uh, what is the true nature of dark matter and dark energy? How did the universe begin? Uh, before Mayer and uh, his collaborator discovered a planet around the star called uh, 51 Pegasus, uh, in 1995. Uh, these questions from one through three were probably being research subject only for dreamy stargazing astronomers. Uh, I mean, not serious astrophysical uh, questions. But now, now that uh, we know that many st uh, stars host planets, including many rocky Earth-like planets, uh, large observational facilities are being built uh, around the world in a, an attempt to answer these questions seriously. Uh, indeed, the 30 meter telescope being built by an international consortium, including India and Japan, will answer these questions in the next 10 years. So today's topics are as follows. After a brief in introduction of uh, my observatory, the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan, NAOJ, uh, including recent scientific highlights, I will talk about uh, 
abounding exoplanets and how astronomers search for candidates for exoplanet harboring life. I will then return to the violent sun, our sun, and its effects on climate, life, and even civilization on the Earth and other planets in our solar system. Uh, when an exo exoplanet with a life-bearing climate is found, the question, do life forms like us exist, will take on new importance. For the first time in history, astronomers are on the brink of being able to scientifically answer this and other big questions with the new generation telescopes. Let me first introduce the uh, National Astronomical Observatory of Japan, a three different institute merged in 1989 to form NALJ. The first big telescope was constructed on Mauna Kea on Hawaii Island in 1998 uh, or nine. This was completely a Japanese project. Uh, this was followed by the construction of uh, ALMA, the largest interferometric radio telescope ever built by humans. ALMA was built by an international co collaboration involving uh, East Asia, North America, and Europe. ALMA is now producing an uh, excellent scientific result. This will be followed by the 30 meter telescope called the TMT to be built by five countries, including uh, India and Japan. The trend toward international collaboration is clear. Uh, big facilities for astronomy observations can be built by collaboration between multiple countries by bringing together skilled people, technology, and money. Uh, dramatic progress in astronomy has been brought about with the increase in light gathering power and spatial resolution uh, let me compare an image of uh, Jupiter seen with just a 10 centimeter telescope and with a 8 meter spiral telescope. Larger telescopes have more light gathering power and simultaneously provide higher spatial resolution. A radio telescope is able to see cold materials in space. Interferometer technology allows many small telescopes to act as a much larger single telescope. We see a clearer picture with a larger telescope consisting of a many smaller telescope. Indeed, the spiral telescope has a 8.2 meter diameter prior mirror, primary mirror, and ALMA consists of a 66 antennas deployed over 10 kilometer range in the Atacama Desert, uh, South America. Uh, you can't just go down to local electronic store and say, give me a world-class telescope. Th this is not possible. Anyway, if you want a big observatory, you have to build it yourself, uh, component by component. Two eminent examples uh, of leading-edge devices developed at NLJ Advanced Technology Center, uh, a gigantic uh, CCD camera uh, uh, mounted on a small telescope and the ALMA uh, receivers. The, the, this CCD camera uh, shown on the uh, left side is uh, uh, about two meter long and weight is about one ton. The primary lens you can see at the bottom here has a diameter of 82 centimeter. It's a big lens. It can achieve uh, image resolution as high as uh, 0.2 arc second. This is the world's best uh, performance with the optics for large field of view. The ALMA receivers pictured on the right was uh, developed by, uh, with the superconducting technology. They are the highest frequency superconducting radio receivers in the world, and uh, they are low noise down near the quantum limit. All this was developed at uh, our observatory in-house, essentially. Uh, NAOJ has been involved in many different activities, including uh, space instrumentation and uh, telescope for outreach and uh, dedicated supercomputer, that the result of which is fed to four-dimensional uh, digital universe theater for outreach purpose and uh, astrobiology center connecting uh, astrophysics and uh, biology to explore the origin of life in the universe and the advanced technology center that I mentioned. Uh, NAOJ's reach today is from the beginning of the universe 
to the search for extraterrestrial life. Uh, far larger in scope than the classical astronomy of the 20th century. Uh, how are astronomers are able to find uh, parents, uh, planets uh, in other part of the galaxy? Uh, this is simple in principle. And let me show this. And as a planet rotates around its parent star, if the planet moves between us and the star, it obscures some of the star's light. If NASA's Kepler Space Telescope satellite is continuously monitors the light from a star, it should show a dip like this. From this dip, we are able to obtain various information about the planet. Kepler discovered over 3,000 exoplanets, planets outside our solar system, some of which are located uh, in the habitable zone where the parent star's heat potentially allows liquid water to exist on the planet's surface. And this is NASA's website showing the number of uh, discovered exoplanets. The current number of confirmed planets outside our solar system has reached uh, 3,735. There are unconfirmed uh, candidates of planet, which is 2,723. So it's huge. Uh, I will show another method to detect the planets rotating around the central star. Though the mass of the central star is far larger than the mass of the planet, uh, the central star is tugged by the planet by a very small amount. This is the same effect that causes the an athlete to move uh, in a circle during the hammer throw. The NAOJ is 188 centimeter reflector telescope that sounds small uh, in this era. Uh, located in Okayama Prefecture of Japan, is active as a dedicated exoplanet hunt telescope. It achieves a world leading observation uh, precision of uh, 2 meter per second about the same speed as a human walking for tracking the motion of the central star. Uh, uh, sun's motion due to Jupiter is about uh, 13 meter per second. So the Okayama telescope could detect a Jupiter-sized uh, planet around a sun-like star. However, the sun's motion due to us is only about 10 centimeter per second. So further technological uh, development is needed before we can detect Earth-like planets orbiting sun-like uh, sun stars. The Okayama telescope has succeeded in producing the first detection uh, for planets around the relatively heavy, heavy stars, heavier than the sun, called uh, A stars. Building on this success, the Subaru telescope is considering observations to detect Earth-like planets in the habitable zones around the faint light stars called M stars as the next step on the path which will lead to search for Earth-like planet around the sun-like stars, and finally searching for Earth-like planet in the habitable zone. And the planet's mass uh, that is a vertical axis versus an uh, orbital period, that is a horizontal axis. Uh, <coughs> for the confirmed exoplanet uh, floated here. And Earth and Jupiter in our solar system are shown here and uh, uh, for comparison purpose. First of all, we are surprised by the diversity of exoplanet, which have a wide range of mass and orbital period. Based on the capital star draw, the distance from the central star is tied directly to the orbital period. So this in indicates the diversity of the orbital period as well. There are many Jupiter-like planets, uh, while we notice uh, significantly fewer Earth-like planets. This is primarily due to the difficulty of detecting and confirming Earth-like planets uh, with the current technology. Uh, there are 100 billion stars in one galaxy and uh, 100 billion galaxies in our universe. So in total, I cannot uh, read, it, there are many zeros. And uh, that is 10 billion trillion uh, number of uh, stars. We now know that uh, many of these stars 
other planets. Uh, this illustrates uh, how planets are formed. Uh, the process starts with the formation and uh, growth of the uh, interstellar gas and dust, uh, dust cloud. So any small cloud or concentration of gas and dust created by chance att attracts more gas and dust due to gravity. So that uh, mass of the uh, cloud becomes slightly heavier with slightly stronger gravity so that it attracts uh, more material. This positive feedback mechanism uh, nurtures the uh, uh, growing crowd until uh, the star is uh, start, uh, start to form in the crowd. After the star forms, uh, there are still gas and dust surrounding the central star. The angular momentum of the system flattens the gas and dust into a rotating disk. So if there is a high school student here tonight, and uh, here is your homework. Think about why it becomes a disk rather than the sphere. So this is a high school physics question. Uh, the Subaru telescope is still one of the largest telescopes in the world. It was completed near the summit of Mauna Kea in 1999. And the Subaru telescope was the first telescope that NLJ built outside Japan. It is uh, one of the most productive telescopes in the world. And let's see how the uh, telescope works. <coughs> and the spiral telescope has a primary mirror and a secondary mirror uh, forming a sharp image behind that. If we remove the secondary mirror uh, located here, that is uh, a secondary mirror, we can mount an instrument at this focus called the prime focus. Among uh, 8 to 10 meter class telescopes, only the Subaru telescope can use the prime focus, enabling ultra-wide field of view observations. Uh, images are blurred uh, due to atmospheric fluctuation. If you have an opportunity to see a star with a small telescope, you may see the star shimmering. This is a severe obstacle to obtaining high-resolution images from ground. In space, on the other hand, uh, since there is no atmosphere, there are no atmospheric fluctuations. Space telescopes have had an advantage in this respect, but ground-based telescopes had an advantage in size because we cannot launch an 8-meter or 30-meter telescope in space easily. So the clean and uh, straight wave front coming from a star is subject to deformation due to changes in the uh, diffractive index of the atmosphere. Uh, the lumpy wave fronts uh, create uh, broad images. Adaptive optics technology has to be developed uh, to remove the atmospheric shimmer. The lumpy wave front can be measured and the deformable mirror correct over 1,000 times per second in response to changes in uh, atmospheric shimmer. So that lumpy wave front is uh, ironed out. In this way, sharp images are recovered with the uh, development of adaptive optics technology the images delivered by a ground-based telescope becomes as good as a space telescope, but with much higher light gathering, uh, light collecting power. So let me show you data uh, taken with a wide field camera located at the prime focus of the Subaru. Uh, you recognize the uh, constellation uh, uh, in the sky, and uh, the Subaru telescope is looking at the uh, very uh, small part of the uh, sky. And all the dots seen here is not a star. It is a, a galaxy far away, maybe six or seven uh, billion light years away. And uh, it has a very wide field of view. So we are looking at uh, different cluster of galaxies. Again, I stress that uh, this is not a star. All dot shown here is a galaxy located far away. So we are moving the field of view, watching the different part of the universe. And we see a uh, uh, big cluster of galaxies where we see the uh, lens effect due to gravity. So the, the sum of the shape of the galaxy is deformed to the very strong gravity of uh, this uh, cluster of galaxies. 
uh, we are actually done of uh, multi-messenger astronomy where data from uh, gravitational telescopes and neutrino detectors are used uh, together with uh, electro electromagnetic data coming from astronomical telescope to understand what is going on the in the universe. India will build the uh, advanced LIGO gravity telescope, and, uh, which will be a very important instrument for uh, multi-messenger astronomy. The discovery of gravitational wave source uh, from GW uh, 170817, that is the name of the source, uh, resulting from the uh, neutron star, neutron star major sound is the advance. So the uncertainty in the location of the gravity wave source was huge, as shown on the left panel. An efficient search to identify the optical counterpart of the gravity wave source was performed with a wide field camera uh, aboard the Subaru telescope. Indeed, the optical counterpart was uh, discovered in, uh, in the galaxy NGC something uh, quite uh, rapidly, thanks to the wide view, view of the Subaru telescope. We have a sophisticated telescope for discoveries. We know that, but after all, astronomy is a remote sensing science, and we have to work with the data Mother Nature gives us. We cannot manipulate the universe like a laboratory experiment to control the experiment. And uh, Mother Nature is very coy with the hint she gives us. In other words, uh, sometimes observations alone are not sufficient to reach a uh, conclusion about what is happening far away in the universe. Uh, in this respect, uh, theoretical astronomy and the supercomputer simulation play a vital complementary role in modern astronomy, supercomputers may be as important as the telescope themselves for a comprehensive understanding. Let me give you one example. The human body needs uh, many different materials, carbon, oxygen, as well as uh, phosphorus, sulfur, potassium, zinc, iodine, and many others. And uh, some elements heavier than the iron are difficult to create in a supernova explosion. One of the major problems in astrophysics is how the universe creates a heavy element essential to living bodies and the rare materials uh, essential for our modern industry. From a combination of the observations and the, new, uh, of nu and the numerical simulation, we learned that the neutron star, neutron star merger can produce up to 10,000 times Earth's mass in heavy, in heavy uh, elements like gold, uh, platinum, and rare metals. It is a competitive process of a neutron capture by nuclei and the beta decay. Uh, neutron, neutron star major is the uh, site of the uh, cosmic uh, alchemy. So uh, let me introduce uh, one more highlight uh, from the Subaru telescope and uh, ARMA. Uh, it takes uh, uh, eight minutes and it takes for lights eight minutes and 19 seconds to travel uh, the distance between the sun and us. In other words, when you look at the sun, you are seeing the sun from eight minutes and 19 seconds ago. Likewise, our uh, nearest uh, stellar neighbor, Alpha Centauri, is 4.3 light years away, meaning you see the star as it appeared 4.3 years ago. We understand that. And with the uh, increasing sensitivity of the Subaru telescope, accompanied by its large field of view, and also with ARMA, we are looking at the galaxies further and further away. And uh, therefore, we are looking further and further back in time. The most distant confirmed galaxy to date is uh, this MSC S1149 something, located 13.28 billion light years away discovered with ARMA. So we are starting to see an interesting era called the reionization phase close to the start of the universe. And TMT uh, strive to detect the universe, the first star and the galaxy, which may include only hydrogen and the helium. Uh, returning to the main topic for today, the birthplace uh, of the planetary system which were observed with the coronagraph mounted on a Subaru telescope. Uh, 
this uh, uh, a chronograph uh, can mask the very bright uh, central star, allowing us uh, to see faint disks and uh, planets around the central star. These spiral telescope observations show protoplanetary disks similar to the one in the earlier figure. But uh, you may notice the shapes and structures are more complex than the simple disk. Uh, ALMA has been developed and operated by collaboration between Asia, Europe, and North America. Uh, 66 uh, parabolic antennas are connected to form a giant radio telescope in the Atacama Desert. ALMA has an uh, unprecedented high sensitivity and high resolution. One of its goals is to investigate uh, planetary systems and their formation, and uh, it is being successful as shown in the next page. Uh, these are protoplanetary disks as observed with ALMA. The spiral telescope observes the disks through reflected visible light originating from the central star, while ALMA detects a thermal emission from the very cold uh, disk. So ALMA has a higher spatial resolution than spiral telescopes. Gaps are commonly seen in disks, and uh, we have begun to find uh, various, various structures, in including uh, spiral arms and horseshoes, which may force us to revisit uh, the uh, disk and the planet formation model that we explained uh, some time ago. Astronomers uh, believe that the gaps are where the planets are formed by consuming the gas and the dust uh, in the disk. So we have uh, better and better observations starting from Hubble Space Telescope followed by a Subaru observation. And with the arrival of ALMA, we begin to resolve the structure as close to the central star as possible. The size of the Earth orbit is beautiful for this uh, TW Hydra images uh, uh, observed with ALMA. Let's see how the uh, dust uh, aggregate around the newborn star and the planetesimals collide to form planet. So bigger and bigger structures are formed uh, eventually the creation of the planet. Asteroid and comets may be uh, remnants left over uh, from uh, uh, forming uh, planets. Uh, Hayabusa 2 is uh, JAXA. It is a, that is a Japanese space agency, uh, JAXA Asteroid Sample Return Mission. Uh, it has uh, arrived at the uh, uh, asteroid called uh, 1999 JU3. Uh, the nickname is Ryugu. Uh, C type uh, near Earth asteroid, asteroid. The Hayabusa will come back to the Earth in 2020 with a sample acquired on the surface of Ryugu. The science goals are to understand the formation process and nature of C type asteroids and search for building blocks for life and to understand the origin and evolution of the solar system. Dugu has not experienced uh, heating uh, metamorphosis, so it preserves information about the primordial solar system. Therefore, it may be rich in volatiles like organic uh, compounds and water, which may be uh, found by sample analysis after the return of the Dugu to us. And this is a comparison between the asteroid Itokawa which was explored by Hayabusa 1, number 1, and uh, Ryugu. Unexpectedly, the surface of the Ryugu is rocky and rough, uh, unlike the Itokawa, which is covered with uh, smooth regolith. The Hayabusa 2 operation team is now doing uh, landing practice uh, repeatedly for an anticipated touchdown with much higher precision than plan to avoid rocks in uh, January of 2019. Let me show you how the Hayabusa land on the asteroid and pick up the uh, samples. So this is a simulation. This is not a real uh, a picture. So the, uh, the Hayabusa deployed a, a small marker, which is a fiducial mark to determine the, its position accurately. 
and then the, the Hayabusa landed, and the bullet is fired, and the uh, projectile fired, and the materials are blown up and acquired by the spacecraft. Uh, this is another experiment. This is a small uh, uh, mass uh, which will uh, uh, collide with the uh, asteroid to create a hole. So uh, this impactor is deployed and the Hayabusa is hiding behind the asteroid not to be affected by uh, explosions. So you will see what is going on. There is a small explosion and uh, a small uh, projectile is emitted. And uh, a hole is created on the surface of the Ryugu. And another uh, marker, uh, positional marker is deployed for to determine the position of the asteroid. And the probe landed just in the center of the hole created by projectile, and picking up the samples, fresh materials, uh, located inside the uh, Ryugu and then uh, goes up to return to the Earth. So that will happen in January uh, 2019. So we are expecting that the experiment is uh, successful. Let me move on to the exoplanet Harbor Life. And I have explained uh, two different methods to detect exoplanet but these are, in a sense, indirect detection methods. On the other hand, high-precision uh, optics of the Subaru telescope with high dynamic range imaging instrument enable the uh, direct imaging of the least massive exoplanet so far called GJ504b. You see the planet actually imaged. And uh, uh, 20 years ago, we thought that uh, our planet, the Earth, was alone. Now we know that uh, we are not alone. The number of known Earth-sized uh, planets has dramatically increased uh, in the past 10 years. So I think this is our current situation. Uh, this is the uh, uh, spectra of uh, Venus, Earth, and Mars, as obtained uh, NASA's uh, Galileo mission. But let's see this data from a different viewpoint. If you are on a planet around a distant star, uh, located far away from the Earth, from our solar system in our galaxy, and if you are an astronomer in that uh, uh, planet, and if you observe the second through fourth planet of our solar system, namely Venus, Earth, and Mars, what could you conclude about the possibility of life on this planet? The spectra from the innermost and outermost planet in the habitable zone show only carbon dioxide. You see the dip that shows the indicate of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of Venus and Mars. Only the third planets which is us, shows uh, water, ozone, and carbon dioxide, which are called uh, biomarkers, indicative of uh, life forms. So the species on the distant planet might guess that the only third planet of the solar system may have uh, life forms because these biomarkers, they are light because we are here. Indeed, uh, this is what human astrophysicists will try to do for other planet with larger telescopes being built and uh, space missions in the next generation. So actual observations of atmosphere of exoplanet to see if their environment are suitable for life and possible to detect uh, life itself, we'll have to wait until the completion of the TMT currently under construction by international collaboration. The large aperture of TMT combined with uh, its powerful adaptive optics system will directly image the sun like uh, uh, us like exoplanet and search for sig uh, signs for life in the universe. Uh, TMT will investigate the atmosphere of a planet. One of the goal is to identify biomarkers in the spectra, as I explained, 
For example, TMT observation will be able to detect lines of molecules linked to life, such as oxygen, carbon dioxide, ozone, and methane in the spectrum of planet with atmosphere. So these observations will tell us whether or not rocky exoplanets have atmosphere similar to that of the Earth or not. Uh, preparation uh, for the uh, construction of TMT is proceeding through a consortium consisting of uh, India, Japan, the United States, Canada, and China. TMT's primary mirror is 30 meter uh, diameter, which has a factor of 16 uh, larger than the uh, Subaru, so that the uh, factor of 16 higher light collecting power than that of Subaru. This huge difference in light collecting power and the spatial resolution would revolutionize astronomy in the coming decade. There is no question about that. This chart how shows how the TMT components were built separately. There is a Japanese contribution. There is a significant Indian contribution to build a, a TMT. So the contribution is India is essential to build uh, this uh, uh, extremely nice uh, telescope. Uh, TMT's primary mirror is segmented, including a total of 492 hexagonal elements, each about 1.44 meters from corner to corner. And they might look the same, but uh, uh, there are 82 different types. The height difference uh, between the two meters, uh, two segments of mirrors, only about 20 nanometers to have a clear image, which is a small. Uh, as, uh, which is the same as the uh, one thousandth of the width of the hair. Uh, let me move on the topic of uh, our own sun, observed by Hinode satellite. Uh, this, the story to be presented in, in this section centers on uh, a sunspot. So I'm changing the topics a little bit. Sunspot is a literary dark spot on the sun that was discovered by Galileo Galilei in 1612. This is sunspot. And the Hinode uh, spacecraft is a JAXA, NASA, United Kingdom, European Space Agency uh, joint work. Hinode has been observing a magnetic field on the surface of the sun with uh, unprecedented resolution and sensitivity since its launch of uh, in 2006. The optical telescope, uh, uh, which is the main instrument of the mission, has a, a primary mirror measuring the 50 centimeter in diameter and uh, is currently the world's largest uh, space telescope for observing the sun. So the impact of the Hinode optical telescope on solar physics uh, is comparable to that of the Hubble Space Telescope on optical astronomy. So Hinode was developed uh, to address the key issues in solar physics. How is the magnetic field created? How is the corona heated? How do explosions, solar flares occur? How is the supersonic solar wind accelerated? So I have been involved in the uh, development of uh, Hinode for about uh, 10 years from its initial concept study to the launch part and scientists and engineers from the United States and Europe also participate in the development and operation. And uh, uh, let me show you some of the data. But before showing the data, may I ask uh, what is a telescope? How do you define the function of the telescope? My answer would be that a telescope shortens the distance to the target. Namely, the observing the sun with telescope is the same as observing the sun up close. Here we see the sun as a uh, telescope uh, zooms closer and closer uh, to its surface. And we draw closer to the sun, we begin to see uh, these uh, convection cells covering the entire surface of the sun. So nuclear energy in the core of the sun is transported to through convection to near the surface. Hot regions of plasma, which are seen as uh, uh, bright patches uh, in the center of the cell, carry heat to the surface and cool down by emitting radiation. The cooled plasma is seen as a dark lane and sinks 
uh, deeper into the sun to be heated once again. So sunspots are dark simply because they are slightly cooler than their surroundings. Since magnetic field hinders the convection motion that carries heat, this movie shows the how the uh, sunspot uh, finally disintegrate due to the attacks of a com a convection cell uh, from the outside. So sunspot has magnetic field and appear in pairs, N, S, N, N polarity and S polarity. These two sunspots uh, correspond to an and then S, or plus and minus. The magnetic field lines are delineated uh, in the X-ray images. So uh, the color in this movie is a false color created by my graduate, my graduate student. The sun is not blue. But uh, this is uh, uh, images of the photosphere. And we can see a big sunspot and surrounding convection cell near the uh, solar uh, edge. The curvature of the edge indicates the size of the image. By changing the filter uh, of the telescope, we begin to see the uh, chromosphere, a layer above a photosphere. The chromosphere was regarded as a dull thin layer in between photosphere and the hot corona in textbooks. But fountains and jet and heating are seen ubiquitously, and these dynamic phenomena are due to the energy of the magnetic field. This is not a numerical simulation. This is a real observation of the solar chromosphere. Uh, while the, uh, let me finish this. And while the optical telescope observes the, the surface of the sun, X-ray telescope uh, capture images of the corona and the high temperature flares that range from between several millions to several tens of millions degree. The area around the sunspot where the strong magnetic field exists further enhances X-rays. So region above sunspot is bright in X-rays due to the heating by magnetic field. Uh, it is fascinating that a solitary star like the sun emit intense X-rays from the corona. The heating of the corona uh, with all the sporadic explosions uh, from X-class flares to ubiquitous tiny burst is driven by utilizing the energy of intense magnetic field. And the source of energy for the sun is in the nuclear fission uh, that takes place uh, at its core. The temperature drops as we approach uh, to the surface, where the temperature measures about 6,000 Kelvin, which we think is cool, cold. The mysteriously, the temperature then starts to rising again above the surface and the temperature of the corona is exceptionally high at several millions of degree. And you are looking at this high temperature corona uh, with temperature one million or two million degree. So it is as if water were uh, boiling fiercely in a kettle placed on a fire stove, as inconceivable as it may sound. The phenomena is referred to as a coronal heating problem. And it is one of the major astronomical mysteries that sometimes that uh, something of a lower temperature is able to heat something of a higher temperature. That is against, that sounds against the second law of thermodynamics. So when I started my graduate uh, course some 40 years ago, I was determined to solve uh, this problem theoretically. In one year of uh, effort, I gave up completely changing uh, my research topics from theory to instrumentation and observation. And I think uh, this was a, a good judgment on my part since the problem of coronal heating has still not been solved even now. Uh, a phenomena, uh, let me show another uh, beautiful example of the Hinode data, a prominence is cold material embedded in the corona. Since it is heavy and dense, because it's cold, it, sh it should have instantly collapsed due to the strong gravitational force of the sun. It is, however, sustained in the middle of the corona due to magnetic force, which overwhelms the strong gravitational force. 
So, so much for solar phenomena. You have an uh, idea what the sun is uh, a little bit. So we proceed to section four. How much does the sun affect Earth's climate? Uh, astrophysics uh, is concerned with our understanding of the universe. It usually has nothing to do with our environment on Earth and civilization. The study of the sun is one exception. Recent studies clearly show that uh, variations in the sun, such as those we learned about today, have a societal effect. The question may be how significant, how serious are those effects. We will see uh, this in this section. Uh, Galileo Galilei built a telescope and discovered a sunspot. His letter, written in 1612, shows a beautiful sketch of a sunspot, as shown here. 400 years later, the same technique uh, is used uh, in the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan just to guarantee the uniformity of the record over 400 years. Similar observations have been done in many observatories all over the world. So the uniform data brings us critically important facts about the magnetic cycle of the sun. It is true that our new knowledge of the mysteries of the sun is obtained through the state-of-the-art satellites such as Hinode. But it is also true that the simple but accurate records on the position of the sunspot by dedicated observers, generation after generation, also provide us with a critical new finding. The number of sunspots increases and decreases with an 11-year period as a result of the internal dynamo action, which has not yet been understood well. This is one of the important issues in astrophysics. But between 1645 and 1715, very few sunspots were observed for 70 years. This is called the Maunda Minima. And there is a record of global cooling during that period. Solar activity, as represented by the sunspot cycle, is somehow affecting the Earth's climate, perhaps in a significant way. So solar magnetic field uh, expand uh, into interplanetary space and form the heliosphere, which includes the Earth. The heliosphere, uh, which is magnetic field, seals the Earth uh, from cosmic rays, which are high energy particles coming from beyond our solar system. When the sun is active, I mean, there are many sunspots on the surface of the sun, the amount of cosmic ray reaching the Earth decreases because the sun is shielded by magnetic field. And when the sun is quiet, the number of cosmic ray increases. So a cosmic ray collides with the atmosphere, entering the atmosphere, collides with the atmospheric atoms, generating uh, neutrons. When a neutron collides with the nitride nucleus, it can generate carbon-14. Usual carbon, that is carbon-12, has six protons and six neutrons, and its atomic number is 12, while carbon-14 has six protons and eight neutrons, and its atomic number is 14. Uh, but it's still carbon, and it is captured in the carbon cycle as carbon-14 dioxide. So carbon-14 uh, dioxide is recorded in the readings by uh, photosynthesis. Since the mass of carbon-14 differs from that of carbon-12, the amount of carbon-14 in the tree ring can be measured. Uh, in summary, higher solar activity result in a decrease in the cosmic rays entering Earth's atmosphere, thus a decrease in carbon-14 in the atmosphere, and the decrease in the carbon-14 recorded in tree ring. So nowadays, uh, astronomers study tree rings and ice cores to know the sunspot number during ancient times. Measuring captured carbon-14 in tree rings and uh, beryllium-10 in ice cores, let us infer the number of sunspots in the pre-telescope era. This has been very successful, and the sunspot number up to 11,000 years ago has been reconstructed accurately. We don't 
do not have the redes uh, resolution to resolve the 11 year solar cycle. Instead, uh, we clearly see many grand maxima and grand minima. So, mound and minimum like events have occurred uh, more than a few times in the past uh, 10,000 years. For instance, we notice a uh, spoiler minimum that occurred between 1460 and 1550, uh, a 90 year span of low solar activity before the mound minimum. Such events are associated with the decrease in uh, oceanic temperature. The latest grand maximum, uh, which started in mid 20th century and ended with the start of the new century, is the largest one in the past uh, 10,000 years. So, I mentioned uh, that the Mount Minimum coincide in time with the cold period. Uh, Professor Aono, uh, who is a Japanese astronomer in Osaka uh, University, uh, developed a very unique method to use the flowering period of cherry blossoms to know the sunspot number in the pre -telescopic, telescopic era. The temperature determines when the cherry trees flower, hotter weather leads to earlier flowering, and the cold we colder weather to later flowering. Using 822 years of historical records on cherry blossoms, viewing parties, etc., the past uh, 1,200 years of temperatures in Kyoto, Japan, in March, were reconstructed successfully. Data between 1911 and 1940 was used to uh, calibrate uh, this methodology, confirming a re remarkable prediction accuracy of uh, 0 0.1 degree. So Kyoto was the capital of Japan from uh, 794 to 1868. Apparently, uh, cherry tree flowering, uh, viewing parties, and episodes such as gift of cherry flowers to the emperor were a major event to the uh, celebrities at that time, such as emperors, aristocrats, politicians, monks, and wealthy merchants. These events were depicted in diaries and chronicles and uh, poets. So this passage here says that the uh, emperor viewed and enjoyed the cherry blossoms in his private palace, and the emperor poured sake, a Japanese wine, for me. So this diary was written in April 14, 1644. And the date is converted to the uh, modern uh, calendar date. Uh, uh, and, and this is a summary of his result. So this line here uh, shows the reconstructed the temperature of Kyoto from the year of 800 to the year of 2000 with the reconstructed sunspot number. We notice rather big change in temperature in Kyoto during the past 1,000 years. We clearly see the uh, signature of uh, global warming here. You see the increase in temperature. And but if we remove the uh, heat island effect, namely that a big city like uh, modern Kyoto has a higher temperature than the surrounding rural area due to the concentrated heat source of the metropolitan city, the modern increase of the temperature becomes moderate, as shown uh, here in the uh, green line. With this uh, compensation uh, for heat island, we notice that uh, uh, 10 centuries uh, was warmer than now. So we see that the uh, uh, top line is a uh, uh, reconstructed uh, sunspot number. So we see the wolf minimum, spora minimum, uh, Mounda minimum, and uh, uh, Dalton uh, minimum in the reconstructed sunspot number. So Occasional low temperature period remarkably coincide with those period of lower solar activity. Temperature decrease uh, appears to occur close to the end of the solar minimum with a delay of a few tens of years. 
Because of the accurate dating and uh, high calibration accuracy, we conclude that uh, there is a high correlation between the winter temperature in Kyoto and the sunspot number over the past uh, 1,000 years. Incidentally, uh, during the Mount Minimum, the Thames were covered with ice. London was really cold during that time, so at least uh, two points on this globe, the temperature was lower during the Mount Minimum. Do we generalize this to global temperature? Uh, there should be a debate on this. So how do, next topic is how do planetary magnetic field protect life and civilization? So needless to say, without the sun, it is impossible for the Earth to harbor its present life-friendly environment. This is unfortunately not the case for our neighbor planet, Mars and Venus. Why do only the Earth have abundant form of life like us? This is one of the fundamental questions that the 20th century astronomy and biology together should address uh, and answer. And, uh, uh, Shock waves and uh, coronal mass ejection from the sun propagate towards the earth in the solar wind. Uh, as shown here, there is the massive shock and uh, coronal mass ejection coming the uh, sun hitting the earth. So uh, in addition to the usual supersonic solar wind coming from the sun, sun almost continuously eject a huge amount of uh, mass and shocks, as shown in this uh, nice movie observed from the NASA spacecraft. And those uh, uh, mass and shocks collide with the Earth, apparently. But the Earth is protected from this uh, bombardment by the Earth's magnetic sphere, uh, although it is not a complete shield. So our modern technology technological civilization occasionally suffer during solar flares, such as DP GPS malfunction, disruption of electrical power system, damage to the uh, commercial satellites, and the radiation hazards to astronauts. So some planets have a strong magnetic field, while others do not have uh, any magnetic field. So this difference is related to whether the internal planetary dynamo works or not. So among rocky planets, Venus and Mars do not have magnetic field, while the Mercury has magnetic field much weaker than the uh, Earth. If a planet has a magnet sphere, that will very effectively shield the planet from the very violent interplanetary space. But without such shield, uh, <coughs> the surface of the planet suffer from the violence directly. Uh, uh, from the sun. So this is clearly seen in the following uh, simulation of Mars. So this is not a real data. This is Mars atmosphere, and this is a numerical simulation. Among these, uh, Venus, Earth, and Mars in the habitable zone, only Earth possesses inherent magnetic field. Do the magnetic field uh, protect the atmosphere and the water from violent mass ejection due to the sun? that may have stripped away the ancient Martian atmosphere. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, early Mars had atmosphere and liquid water and ocean, possibly. Mars is smaller than the Earth. Uh, let's see this one. Uh, and its weak gravity struggles to hold the uh, Martian atmosphere and water so early Mars had a magnetic field, but Mars lost uh, its own magnetic field in ancient times. The young sun was much more active than the, the present sun, emitting intense UV X-rays and powerful winds. The initial rich Martian atmosphere might have been lost due to intense solar storm. So Mars very fortunately has a magnetic field so that we are able to hear today. While Mars does not have any magnetic field to protect its initial atmosphere and water, maybe. As a result, as a result, Mars is currently a no man's land, though it is located in the habitable zone. 
So habitable zone refers to the location of planet orbits where the planet is not located too close to the central star where the water is vaporized and the planet is not located too far away where the uh, water is frozen. So Venus, Earth, Mars are uh, located in the sun's habitable zone. Only the Earth is habitable now. I pointed out the Earth's magnetic field may have, uh, may have contributed to the emergence of life on Earth, not on the other two planets. Likewise, a planet called Kepler-2022b is known to be located in the habitable zone. We do not know yet if the planet has magnetic field or atmosphere, which uh, magnetic field may uh, uh, life sustainable. So we are entering the final section. Where did the building blocks for life come from? Is there other intelligent life in the vastness of space? So astronomers do anticipate that uh, in a few decades from now, with the most advanced uh, telescope like TMT built by Japan and India and other countries, the biomarkers indicating the existence of water, ozone, carbon dioxide, methane, and any other essential materials for life will be found in the atmosphere of Earth-like planets in the habitable zone. This discovery, once made, may deliver a fundamental and uh, a permanent impact to humanity. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? People on this globe may even consider the possibility of a Carl Sagan's contact situation more seriously. Uh, one hint that may be related to this question is the ALMA discovery of organic materials in the very cold space. So organic molecules were surprisingly uh, discovered uh, in Milky Way star forming region, which is a very cold region and methanol were discovered where the planet are formed as shown here. And many molecular emission lines were detected in the center of our starburst galaxies. These observations may, may indicate essential molecules linked to the life comes from the outer space. So let me summarize uh, my talk. So in this talk, we looked forward to the discovery of biomakers on Earth-like exoplanet in the late 2020s and early 2030s by large observational facilities uh, like TMT and the Space Telescope, of course. We explained that the magnetic field of the parent star can have a large influence on climate, life, and civilization on that planet, and that the planetary magnetic field is important to maintain an uh, environment that can sustain life. When an exoplanet with a life-bearing climate is found, the question, do life forms like us exist, will take on new importance. So this is not a science fiction. This is a real question that astrophysicists in 21st century has to face. So the discovery of an extraterrestrial civilization by SETI, uh, which stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, could become astronomy's next big question. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, of course, uh, any question? If, yeah. Thank you very much for this absolutely fascinating talk. I'm still uh, reeling from the realization that cherry blossoms can give you <laughs> <laughs> the temperature of the earth. Fantastic. We can, uh, it, it might be running late, but we can take a few questions. Uh, there are microphones floating around. What are the current instrumental challenges we are facing in our search for it? Uh, main challenges, uh, you are asking the uh, main challenges when we develop a new instrument. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned, we need a big telescope, very big telescope. So uh, Japan and India uh, together with other countries 
is building a 30 meter telescope. The current biggest telescope in the world is a 8 meter or 10 meter telescope. But 30 meter telescope is much, much more difficult to build. So this is already a very significant challenge. Also money-wise, to build the TMT, we need uh, 1.8 billion dollars just to construct the telescope. Also, so once we have an excellent 30 meter telescope in operation, we need a good instrument to detect the planet. That is called a, a coronagraph. We need an extremely sensitive instrument to detect faint light uh, from the planet surrounding the a central star which is orders of magnitude brighter. So detecting a planet, Earth-like planet, circling the uh, mother star is already a challenge. In addition, I'm saying that the atmosphere of that planet can be detectable with the uh, uh, spectrometer uh, attached to the 30 meter telescope. So we are able to know whether the exoplanet has uh, green trees or ocean or atmosphere with uh, oxygen or carbon dioxide. So I believe that uh, these inf pieces of information will become available with the, we astronomers work very, very hard to make a good instrument. <laughs> sustaining uh, planets and uh, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. I, I think this is a very important question. Astronomers face this kind of question sometimes. It's hard to persuade. <laughs> so as I said, uh, we are able to detect the atmosphere that can potentially sustain the life but we cannot uh, reveal whether civilization exists there or not because this is not astrophysical issues. Or well, maybe we can detect uh, radio signals from the civilization uh, from uh, on that star that may be a part of the astronomy. But uh, even if we know that uh, there is someone over there, there is no means to uh, shake hand. And they cannot come here, we cannot go there, due to the limitation of the speed of light, as you pointed out, it's a relativity constraint. So the question is why are we uh, astronomers are working so hard to know the existence of the life form in other planets? Okay, okay, we, we are spending $1.8 billion to construct TMT. Japan is, is investing a lot, and India is investing a lot. I, uh, why do we do this? Because this is so important. This is fundamental science. And we all want to know where we come from on this earth. So it's a question of physics, combined physics, chemistry, life science, everything. So that, so I said at the last part of my talk, the question is philosophical. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? 
So this is an important scientific question. At, at, at the same time, this is somewhat philosophical, cultural question. Do you want to know the answer? I, I want to know the answer. So 1.8 billion dollars to construct the telescope that can run for 50 years to know much about our origin is not necessarily expensive. Maybe you may not agree. <laughs> <laughs> you have a different answer, Tomak. I, I think it's a very unique question, and uh, of course, uh, it has many answers. Yeah, but uh, I, I respect your question. Why do, you, do we invest so much money uh, in, in a situation of economic crisis? Uh, we, we take that message seriously. Uh, our obligation is to build a big ter good telescope to know more about the universe for you, for us. But I mean, as you, as you uh, also mentioned, I don't think uh, the fundamental assumption there in, in that um, we'll never be able to go to another planet or, um, or interact with another society, who knows? I mean, it might take uh, you know, a century to get to another planet at current technology, but did you even uh, envisage current technology a hundred years ago? Did you think that I'll be able to live stream a, yeah, a lecture maybe. 20 years ago? So we don't know how our technology will evolve. So I think we'll have to be future ready all the time. And uh, there might be other civilizations that might have far more advanced technology. They might come to us rather than we go there. So I think that's, that would be my response. I think we should yeah. be prepared. But nevertheless, I think your question is important. Very nice question. Uh, very nice question. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. It's also a question that uh, I think we can discuss all evening. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, can I, uh, there's a young man here who wants to So, you said that uh, intelligence, uh, intelligent life. So, suppose we find life and we can communicate with them. But what if they can't send a message back? Because they need to be intelligent to understand the message and uh, compu uh, compute it. They need to understand what we are saying. Uh, question is so the question, his question is, uh, we, we are trying to communicate with extraterrestrial intelligence, but how can we guarantee that they can understand what we are saying? Uh, good question. <laughs> I have never thought about that. <laughs> uh, I'm struggling to observe the planets, and this, this, is, uh, this is a question that becomes important beyond that uh, discoveries. But this is an important question. How do you communicate? Uh, assume that uh, we'll find a civilization somewhere on the distant planet by detecting a signal uh, from that planet that, that, that is shown in the movie uh, called uh, Contact. I like that movie very much, by the way. And you should see, and that tells how we do that. And uh, it's a good question. Uh, you are very young. Think about this. and. Uh, uh, maybe my next talk will address that <laughs> question <laughs> when I come here next time, not now. <laughs> there are open questions out there. Uh, yeah. actually, uh, during our talk, uh, you, uh, you mentioned that actually the Mars, uh, uh, for some reasons, it lost its magnetic field. So that's, that's why, why uh, uh, it was not, not, not able to sustain atmosphere. Uh, and uh, that's why there is no uh, evidence of life uh, as of now. So uh, what is the reason that Mars uh, was not able to uh, retain the magnetic field? Uh, the, the difference the between the Earth and the Mars is that uh, Mars is smaller in size. So that uh, it tends to lose the uh, heat uh, more easily. Uh, yes, so the magnetic field of a planet is created by a dynamo process inside the uh, planet. So we need a liquid conductive material uh, inside the planet to generate a magnetic field that is dynamo. So us has a liquid uh, ion or something so that the dynamo continues work so that we have a magnetic field. But mass is smaller so that uh, uh, everything is uh, frozen already. No liquid uh, conductive material inside the mass, probably. So no dynamo works 
and the magnetic field disappears in early days of uh, after mass formation of Mars. That the scientists believe now. And the similar case is with the Venus, because Venus also does not have a magnetic field. Uh, Venus does not have a, I think, magnetic field. But and uh, Mercury as well. And Mercury has a smaller magnetic field. So depending on the planet, uh, the amount of magnetic field is different. But in general, if the dynamo works inside the planet, it uh, sustains the magnetic field. But uh, planets like uh, Mars and Mercury is also small, and Venus, I'm not sure, lost the magnetic field, probably. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. that you showed about the sunspot activity and the cherry blossoms in Japan. Uh, has there been, have there been any further studies which... Uh, so whereby they interpolate the entire planet's temperature profile, profile uh, in, in relation, relation to, to the sunspot activity in the past? past. And, and my, my second, second question, question is, is there, there any kind of predictability to what comes uh, 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 was the activity, activity sunspot activity that might occur in the future, future which, which may help, help us... us uh, I think uh, this is a very good question. I, I believe that uh, this summer was quite hot and uh, it may indicate uh, a global warming. And the global warming is, I believe, due to a greenhouse effect. But I'm pointing out some may, the, our sun may affect uh, the climate of the Earth. Uh, so that uh, if you have uh, another amount of minimum, the temperature may be slightly lower in, in, in the tendency of increasing temperature. So the prediction of uh, solar activity and the resultant uh, the, the prediction on the Earth temperature and climate is very important. And solar astronomers, uh, there are many good solar astronomers in India as well, is claiming that uh, uh, the effect of the sun should be studied more thoroughly and the effect of the sun uh, should be predicted by somehow. But this is difficult. The prediction of the uh, uh, earthquake in Japan is a very difficult topic. Likewise, the prediction of the sunspot uh, in the future is a very difficult topic as well. It has not yet possible. Thanks very much. We'll take one last question. Satellites of planets. What about satellites of planets in our own solar system? Enceladus uh, and uh, the bodies like that are candidates to have a life. Uh, people believe that uh, there is a very big ocean uh, inside the, those uh, bodies and that maybe the place where life form exists. So that is another possibility. But detecting that small body is more difficult. Uh, so maybe the best way is to explore our, our own solar system, like probe, like Hayabusa 2, to go there and pick up materials and return to the Earth for further analysis. Yes. An extremely uh, productive two days of talks between our Japanese colleagues and ourselves. Um, about future collaborations between Japan and India. And I thank you very much for agreeing at the end of this to top it up with this public talk, which I think has been uh, wonderfully taken. But I don't want you to be here all night answering questions. <laughs> it would have been wonderful. Um, but thank you very much for coming today. And, uh, and please uh, continue coming to our series of talks. We have announcements about the next one. So thank you very much. And let's uh, applaud. Okay. So uh, thank you, sir. So the next talk will be on 11th of December at 6 p.m. The talk will be given by Neil Sanderson from Glasgow University and the topic would be related to gravitational waves. 
सो थैंक यू सो मच फॉर कमिंग हियर वील सी यू सोन ऑन डिलेवेंथ थैंक यू